two, one. All right, welcome everyone to podcast number four of The Start Is Near. And we are broadcasting live. And Marco, give me a thumbs up if in the main room they can watch the live broadcast. Great, awesome. Okay, um, well, we have a new uh, member, uh, guest, hopefully permanent member. Welcome, Ben. And uh, Victor, do you want to give any intro? Maybe just let us know to what extent Ben's been brought up to speed, if at all. If not, we can bring him up to speed, which is good for our audience anyway, to get a, you know, a, a bit of... It is actually show. important for the audience, too, because everyone's kind of an amateur, or authentically an amateur. But yeah, Victor, go ahead. <laughs> well, so Ben and I met, uh, I think, at the STOA and uh, reconnected again most recently, like through Twitter. And we've been like jamming on themes of like sociotech, uh, like exploring things like um, you know, personal development, uh, and in particular, like personal development, and like a recursive loop through improve uh, through through improved AI and the use of AI to facilitate uh, like personal development. Um, I'll uh, I'll. Just say like Ben's a, a good friend, a great co uh, and you know we are on a co-creative journey in a squad ourselves. Um, yeah, I think uh, um, just tossing Ben in on the deep end, if you will. Like, not a lot of context coming into this conversation at all. But he's all like, "Hell yeah, let's let's go!" <laughs> and so here we are. Uh, if you'd like to say a few things, Ben, like by all means, like uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Um, my name is Ben Honer. I'm interested in exploring systems and complexity and consciousness and uh, through the lens of technology. And I use the term technology very broadly, uh, as in like language is a technology um, that evolves. And uh, yeah, I'm just very curious. I don't have too much context, but uh, thanks for inviting me. We like immersion here, Ben. We like to throw people into the deep end immediately uh, if we think that, you know, you can do it. But yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, Jamin, uh, go ahead if you would like. Yeah, sure. I'll let, well, let me give, um, I think, just a really brief, like, five minutes tops introduction to um, one perspective on collective uh, super intelligence. I'll do this by sharing the the whiteboard here. Um, so imagine that Jamie Jamie is becoming a master of sharing screens. By the way, guys, <laughs> go ahead, Jamie. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so imagine that um, this circle represents a conversation, right? And imagine that these solid little dots represent people who are in the conversation. And imagine that there's another conversation happening in parallel over here. And one of these people dots hears about it and says, hey guys, I'm gonna take a little field trip over there. And another one says, I think I will too. So they join <clears throat> this other conversation which was happening by, let's say, these blue dots, and then these couple white dots pop in, and then some of the blue dots get interested in what they hear about the other conversation, so they take a trip over there, and so on and so forth. We call this cross-pollination, right? And so imagine that we have a whole population, if you will, of conversations represented by these white circles. I won't spend half an hour filling in dots around each, but you can just imagine people in each of those conversations. And um, we have a dream, we have a vision that I know I share with many, if not most, if not all of you, of this universe of conversations growing and growing and growing and essentially becoming self-aware you know just like the original two conversations in the picture became aware of each other and people started cross-pollinating and getting to know both there are myriad ways that the universe of conversations 
can become self-aware and get to know each other. And then if you um, if you think of that universe as being encapsulated by what I'm going to draw as something like a brain, right? Um, these each conversation you can sort of think of as a way glorified neuron, right? Doing its own thinking. And just like we're broadcasting this conversations, conversations can broadcast to each other. So some people over here hanging out, having their own conversation might get a message from a bot or from an or from a human saying hey there's really cool stuff happening in this conversation right there let's tune in and listen to their broadcast for a few minutes and then some of these people might choose to then cross pollinate over there and say hey you guys are awesome love hearing what you're talking about we're talking about something very parallel and so between cross pollination broadcasting recording transcription and all kinds of amazing AI related stuff that we can do with transcripts, right? Um, with, you know, using, you know, really simple technologies like word frequency and whatnot, uh, conversations that are really cool and really exciting, like this one, can learn about systematically and programmatically, uh, discover other conversations that are either parallel, complementary, uh, maybe an opposite in, in certain senses, in which case maybe there's room for a debate, you know, a respectful co-creative debate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the big idea, well, there's a lot of big ideas here because this for me represents, especially as more and more conversations cross the blood brain barrier from outside the universe to inside the universe and say, hello universe, we are here too, right? Um, now, one really interesting thing about this, I'm just going to call it a universe of conversations. And there's an acronym we came up with a couple of years ago, which I'll write down here, which is Dutch 42. And so we came up with the idea of hashtag Dutch42 being the decentralized. In other words, there is no center. There's no one you have to impress and say, hey, can I get your permission to enter the universe, the decentralized universe of what? Of transformational conversations. So basically stuff other than, you know, sports rap, or fashion week, or I, I don't know what else. Uh, so transform. No, you got this, Jamie. You got this. Tra transformational conversations, which are hyperlinked, right? You know, level zero, ground zero of hyperlinkage is um, existing in the same map, existing in the same database of you know self-aware conversations. Of course, they're aware of themselves, but they're also aware of the rest of the universe. And forty-two. Uh, this comes from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Gal uh, to the Galaxy, and it represents just, it's sort of a stand-in for Telos. You know, what is the aim? What is the mission? What is the purpose of all this? And maybe there are myriad purposes. J Jamin, if I may, I raised my hand just because oh. Ben is kind of like our uh, our new audience in terms of explaining this. So, and and people will be listening in posterity. So, Ben, if you wanted to like ask a question or something, uh, I think we could take time to interject questions and comments you know feel free to say hey that's all really stupid i've got a better idea Th that's all fair game <laughs> that's why victor brought ben here yeah yeah this sucks kick the can like i'm joking jamin yeah go ahead ben sorry yeah sure thanks uh so far i think it's making sense it's a very very intriguing um concept i'm curious about um the sort of state of everything are you are you still sort of building and refining this model are you thinking at, of like specific interventions in the system like creating these technologies creating a platform a community what, what, how about that yeah i'll i'll start with the second question first in terms of technologies and whatnot um it 
it kind of feels like t in terms of technology, we're at Walmart and everything's free and we have these giant shopping carts. There's so much free stuff off the shelf that we, we can just dump into our carts. So the technology is kind of the least of our problems. In fact, I think it, it, it kind of feels like the technology has gotten ahead of uh, the collective human intelligence. So, you know, if you just walk into a Starbucks in Seattle and say, hey, intelligence, what comes to mind? 90% of the answers will be AI, right? And if you say, what about collective human intelligence? They'll look at you like you're some unwashed hippie who thinks the Vietnam War is still going on and, you know, get this guy out of here because he's stupid and, you know, a relic. And, um, but for me, um, the real exciting part of intelligence is precisely collective human intelligence, right? And the potential for a human, I mean, look, brilliant conversations are happening all over the place all around the world all the time but they're but we're isolated from each other and mm -hmm. the conversation is not you know being elevated to its place and the idea of even bringing conversations together is not, is barely even being talked about right so one of my favorite one of my memes is that conversations worth having are conversations worth sharing with the world, which means, you know, sharing them with the rest of the universe. So we're kind of like a right here in this room, we're kind of like a collective little prince. Um, if that reference resonates with everyone, um, we're like a collective little prince. Uh, that's my background, by the way, on my computer, Jamin. It's oh. an artist rendition of the little prince. And I yeah, read I it in French first because famously, again, uh, I didn't learn a subject in English except for English until I was 14 years old. Uh, but yeah, so the Petit Prince, whatever, I, my le, French sucks, though. Le, yeah, yeah. Le Petit Prince, yes, okay. James, don't make fun of me. Don't make fun of me, James, in the background. Yeah. I feel like he's laughing in his chair there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I feel like we're... Go uh, ahead, James. Sorry, you, James, you are going to make a joke? Oh, yeah, go, go ahead, James. <laughs> no, I just said you guessed correctly. I'm laughing at him. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, we're like a we're like a collective in this case, whatever six of us at the moment, um, or seven of us. We're like a collective little prince on this little planet with a palm tree or whatever, and we're based and we've got a little radio ham radio thing, and we're broadcasting to the rest of the. Is there anybody out there, right, who's even approximately on the same wavelength, and? What is our wavelength, right? You'll notice that, you know, we've got a space for telos, a, a, a placeholder for that. But it's not like we're here saying, you know, we, this is our telos and, you know, everyone should believe like what we believe. Kind of the opposite of that. Believe whatever you want to believe. Talk about whatever you want to talk about. But let's get together as a decentralized universe of transformational conversations. That's perhaps the one filter, transformational. In other words, not sports rap, not fashion week. Not Britney Spears got a haircut, but you know, really. And go ahead, Ben, take it, please. Yeah, yeah. This is my job is to interject. Don't worry. But again, Ben, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just uh curious what transformational is. Okay, very good. So um it's intentionally left undefined because different people have their own definitions. If you ask for mine, um, and it's kind of a function of history. At this particular moment in history, transformational means going from an omnicidal path to hell, which is what humanity is on right now, and stepping on... Jamin, the... for the recording, explain omnicidal for Ben. Yeah, it's like, you know, genocide or suicide, so it's death, but omnicide is like death to all, right? To all life forms, all of humanity, etc. So we're on an omnis a seriously omnicidal trajectory. What's with the thumb down? Anyway, you're on mute. You're muted, Mike. Anyway, Mike, you'll unmute when you feel like it. But so transformational um, is to basically, at this moment in history, the most urgent thing to transform is the biggest course correction in human history, which is to get us off um, the highway to hell uh, 
and on to a highway. Jamin, I'm sorry to interrupt. The thumb down was, I don't want us to be omnicidal. Something oh. happened. I had a call there that happened right at that moment. But yeah, I don't want us to be omnicidal. I was thumb downing like, I don't want us to be omnicidal. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Right. I, don't, I, don't, I think you're in good company. I don't think anyone in this room wants us to be omnicidal. No, I know. I just wanted to course correct. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, the, but the reality is, and part of transformational is having the collective um, consciousness to actually get real about the trajectory we are we're on and a fair characterization of that trajectory is precisely omnicidal right that's not a lot that's not a popular notion that people like to embrace and oh yeah we're on an omnicidal trajectory now let's do something about it they don't what, even what do our collective behaviors look like right Jamin? yeah they, they are they are omnicidal i mean if i were like a, an intelligent martian with a high-powered telescope and micro and and listening device i'd say this species is hell-bent to kill itself why does it hate itself so much um but you know that our collective behavior sums up to omnicide so the the, the biggest course correction uh, in human history would be for us to get off this trajectory and get onto a new trajectory um but that's going to take a heck of a lot of design designing the new trajectory uh designing the off-ramp from the existing trajectory designing the on-ramp to the new trajectory designing you know the connective tissue between the aforementioned off-ramp and the aforementioned on-ramp and uh and also a heck of a lot of pr and marketing <laughs> right and you know how do we do this with um uh with everyone happily going along, meaning not losing stuff that they consider to be precious, and um, but rather, you know, gaining the opportunity to survive for all of us to survive and for all species to survive as many as can be saved. Now that we're hemorrhaging hundreds of species per day to the sixth mass extinction, which all goes hand in hand with exponential planetary overheating, uh, exponential growth in industrial agriculture, including animal agriculture. If, if I may, Jamin, um, yeah. you actually did have, I and mean, we're, we have our two hour gap here or whatever. So this is great. Um, you actually wanted to come in and, and Ben, I hope that I, you uh, don't uh, feel insulted or offended that I'm like taking you as the, the amateur in the room or whatever, but Jamin, you wanted to talk about book one and book two. And we have this kind of like mid period here where there's perfect time to kind of, yeah, you got me. Okay, great. Um, and Ben, just j liberally raise your hand whenever you feel, like. or, 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 <laughs> or, or just, just interrupt or whatever. Or yeah, just yeah. jump in. You know, it's it's all good. And actually, oh, um, one of the things we forgot to mention is kind of like what are the ground rules for this meeting? Basically, be nice, be kind, be generous, and be thoughtful. Um, and sometimes that means don't be loquacious. Unless everyone's like egging you on, like sometimes Brett gets on here and has a brilliant flow and we basically and he says, I'm talking too much. We say, no, 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 keep going. So, you know, be be concise, but within reason. And so you'll often hear me saying passing the talking feather and all that. In fact, I'm talking way more than I usually do, but that's because I'm being egged on to. But that's in service of what we were talking about anyways. Right, Jamin? Yeah, it, exactly. Go ahead, Ben. Go ahead, Ben. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all really interesting um in terms of uh yeah i mean i i feel like uh the trajectories we're on are open to perspective in terms of the the course uh that we're going um based on the the level of analysis if you're looking at like a purely object level um you know, uh, look, uh, gathering metrics uh, around the sort of direction of things that are trackable by metrics, like uh, CO two or anything like that. I think, um, yeah, it looks like like we're on a pretty bad trajectory. Um, but to bring it back into this collective consciousness thing, um, there are a lot of things that are not quantifiable, and one of the things that I've seen is discussions like the one we're having right now in groups of people like the one that are occurring right now uh, i've seen them occurring more and more and it seems like there is some sort of emergence happening where people are beginning to collectively um 
reconnect with community and and collectives i feel like there's a uh, a separating force in in modern technology that has sort of uh pushed people and kind of maybe isolated them a little bit but for for some reason it seems like independently all over the internet there are different groups cohering organically that are all focused on very similar things um which gives me hope the the fact that this is this is kind of emerging organically with no um targeted pr or um any type of oh we're gonna work for the pr don't worry ben we're gonna get there agenda. soon yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah and I, I, so i think everybody is contributing in in their own ways and it's it's kind of like an organic um smattering of different diverse groups that all have different perspectives on how to affect change in a positive way and as victor and i were talking about earlier is is um one of the highest leverage things we can do is empower other people who are building communities and distributing messages to wide groups of people. If we can empower those people, then and showing them that it's easy, right, Ben? Yeah, exactly. Like it's, it's not it's not hard. It's just people just don't know what the tools are or something. Yeah, if you if you can show them like here's how we do it. Here's a, a set of packaged social technologies that you can use to um you know record and disseminate all, all those um action words that you used uh earlier um i think that'd be really amazing and would well, help i'm gonna pass it i'm gonna pass it to victor for a second before jamin goes but victor please go ahead all right so like there's the uh the the sort of conscious element that I, I heard, you know, been pointing towards, like, you know, emergently folks seem to be coming aware, you know, of this need of like, well, I don't know, Gavin, Gavin talks about it as like a singularity or, or an, a, an awakening. And like, uh, yeah, there's a smattering of it out there. Like, it's just sort of, it's, it's in my water, at least in the water, you know, that I'm swimming in. And uh, I see it more and more. And it all seems at the moment to be sort of like hap not happening in isolation because we're, here we are. We are not in isolation. We are here together. And, uh, you know, with the added benefit of like streaming and being able to record and put on YouTube. So there's like, you know, transmission channels. But what I'm hearing from, uh, from, um, from you, Ben, is like, yeah so there's like this uh there's there's those tools and i'm hearing from you know jamin is like yeah totally so how to like create the tools that enable the interconnection or the, sort of the the super intelligence across you know all of these uh these uh these groups and uh and yeah that's i think that's not far from where we landed actually in our previous conversation a move from like vision to to action you know move to like um you know uh, there's a version of that that to me looks like yeah okay so what's the thing to build well then like what's the outcome that you're trying to affect and you know how then like you know go through the design process to like make something that drives the outcomes that you want to create. So like, um, yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, that's the piece that I'm kind of coming into this conversation with of like, yeah. Like, no, it's a great, it's a great thing. ball to toss in there, right, Victor? Like, it's awesome. Um, I think he was fascinated to you, Jamin. Uh, Gavin, if you feel you want to interject anytime, please do. But Jamin, go ahead. And Ben, I, I, again, I want to appreciate that uh, you are kind of a person that allows for the recording for posterity to have other people come in and uh, learn about this stuff. Um, Gavin, are you ready? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try and ask a bunch of questions. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ben. All right. Gavin, whenever you're ready, just jump in. Jamin, go ahead. No, I'm I'm going to defer to others. I've I've had enough of the microphone for a bit. I'm happy to talk more, but only if no. Well, it's it's either that. James or Marco then, because I do have a thought, but I'm going to put either Marco or James on the spot. 
Well, I'll like, come, like come in there just a second there. Like, um, um, yeah, Go I ahead. What Victor was saying there, like, I get it. It's exactly that, like, in a sense. Um, like Ben was saying, like, that it seems to him like that there's a lot of these conversations and seems to be more and more of these conversations now floating out there. And, of, of course, they are because of the fact of more people are, you know, the majority of people around the world are becoming more acutely aware of the predicament we seem to globally find ourselves in. Uh, they're more than acutely aware because of social media of the madness that our governments are lead and trajectory the governments are leading us in towards a possible world war, you know, nuclear war, whatever. A lot of that's on most people's mind now at the moment. And I, I guarantee you that, you know, there's not a lot of people out there who are who that their main focus is to for all you know for us to get together and try and solve these issues. It's um it's mostly panic that's going on at the moment. Um confusion that's going on at the moment but yes as ben said there are these you know select conversations like our own going on and there's a lot of them out there the problem is and what jamin is if we do is connecting them i like gavin said there in this in the chat there um you know like you know cocoon to butterfly it's it can be ugly but it, it's natural yes it is and I, I i'm aware as well that a lot of the situations that are going on can be considered natural, like our climate can be very much considered natural unless you really look into the ins and outs of it and see that it's not actually natural anymore. It's now been man, you know, forced by man intervention, so to speak. So the point I'm making is that enough of these conversations are out there and enough of people are aware of our, you know, the present urgency with the whole world finds itself in that it only takes an uh, somebody like ourselves and, and other groups like ourselves to eventually figure out that yes we're there's concerned citizens out there trying to figure out what you know whether there's something you want to tackle in your neighborhood because or your community because there's an imminent disaster facing your community or whether it's something that's maybe just a little longer down the road but it's going to be facing your community or when, when you're ready james i want to raise my hand on what you're saying but i i have a question for you yeah, but my, my general point is that, look, if you look at it, as you as you were saying there, Victor, if you look at a specific problem and you put that into it as a topic of conversation you and invite anyone that was interested in that specific problem or predicament uh, or, or, you know, to come together to try and understand it and, and maybe try and fix this, we just said the problem, right, or, or whatever. You will, you will gather enough people who are interested in that subject to come to that conversation is what I'm saying. It's it's in general what we need to do is convince the world that we're in a global predicament and that we need to get have global conversations connected, basically. In simple that's the both the simplest way I can put it and passing the feather. So that's that's exactly what I was gonna capitalize on your conversation there. Not capitalizing on monitors, I'd say I mean in terms of the idea. Um so many of us and Mark was in here earlier, we're talking about and I hope, James, that you meet Mark with some takes. I think that you guys are going to get along in terms of your uh, your ability to, like, just grow forward and stuff. But um, so if we're talking about these movements forward the way that we are, how do we translate this conversation? And again, all of us are working in different ways to do so. Um, and sorry, James, I just close my eyes when I think, so I don't know if, the, if anyone notices that on the video, it doesn't matter. But the idea is, is that we can translate this conversation somehow to help other people who are totally new to this stuff to make small, not small, that's the wrong word, but just like uh, units of participatory action or something, Right. The idea of like there is no unit of participatory action too small, um, and people get hung up on that. Um, and James, obviously, you know what's going on in UK and stuff, uh, and Ireland. So that's a whole different story. But I don't want to disrupt the flow that way. But I think you get what it, gather what my question is. Like, how do we uh, help others? It join this conversation. Hmm. Here's a perhaps a additional framing to that um what yeah, please ben go ahead take your time yeah um maybe like what are like the the five most valuable um things that people could do 
based on your past discussions um, and and thinking on and and to Ben remember frame this in like locale too like your own local environment local like action, yeah. yeah 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 definitely um because it, it sounds like y'all have done some fairly deep thinking on this and on sort of like a meta levels how do we facilitate to put it mildly energy? Ben to put it yeah. mildly you're in good company yeah <laughs> yeah yeah how, so how do we facilitate these conversations um it sounds like you know you've done a lot of thinking of that how would you distill that into you know some some really basic things that people could directly do locally so that you know you facilitate all the the, the desirable traits of, that you've been discussing like um discovery of other conversations and, and when, when you're ready ben i'm going to yield to jamin and then victor but yeah uh sorry when you're ready yeah no that, that was it yeah what, what are some of the or Gavin, do you want to go ahead? You're ready. If you're ready, go ahead, please, Gavin. No, no, not ready. Yeah, okay, get yeah. Jamin and then Victor, please. Okay, cool. So, um, I I used to think along the lines quite a bit along the lines of precisely your question, uh, you know, Ben, what can we do, right? And and in fact, this very venue of the 24 hour collective intelligence block party that happens every Friday. We started this a little less than four years ago on Valentine's day, 2020, just before COVID happened. And, um, basically the idea of a collective intelligence block party came out of the awareness that, Hey, there are a bunch of groups working on collective intelligence. Why don't we block off the ends of the street, crank up the base, and, you know, bring out the food and beer and wine and, you know, the bong is in the back, keep it on the down low, but everybody come on, come to the block party and, you know, make your presence known and, you know, let's do this. And so, and since that coincided with COVID, we had quite an, an influx of people, you know, work being part of these different cool local communities or virtual communities or whatever. And that's how... Uh, that's how we met Brett, uh, Brett Minster full of it. And, um, and then ultimately all of you came through, or most of you came through that connection. Um, and so my, you know, our thinking, my thinking anyway, and I, I know I speak for possibly all of us, certainly most of us has lately evolved into, and I'll screen share again, cause I'd like to talk with pictures sometimes, um, we started coming up with like, uh, like what are the elements of collective intelligence? Jim, Jim, yeah. if this is recorded and we can quip this and stuff, why don't you just explain to Ben from top down? Cause I love this one. Okay, sure. So th this, yeah, th yeah. these are some of the elements of collective intelligence, you know, just like getting really elemental. And I kind of think of this as sort of like, you know, bringing in the laws of physics, if you will, you know, atoms, molecules, quarks. So, you know, what do we got? Well, we've got the individual. A cluster of individuals can be a community or a group. Um, we talked about conversation with a bunch of individuals, you know, clustered around it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, platforms are really important because, for example, there's so much that we can do just like with Twitter. It's kind of a perfect frictionless free messaging system that's maximally public. And that's really important. Um, you know, links, I talk about hyperlinks and all that cross pollination, signaling, messaging, uh, transcription is really important. Video recordings of conversations, bots who can also travel around. And I mean, imagine we had, you know, 50,000 bots here, each one representing the fifth, each of the 50,000 other conversations that are closest to this conversation. Right. And then every once in a while, a bot, bot freaks out and starts raising its hands and going, oh, ooh, ooh, you guys got to hear this. In, in the conversation that I'm representing, there's this all this cool stuff coming on. And here's what I suggest we do. Let's create like a mashup room or an overlap room or a whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, the one thing I haven't addressed here on this little map, this little key yet is this boundary thing. So let me go up to this picture. So here you've got all these people participating in this conversation, like us participating here. Then there's a boundary layer and the, like literally in the main Zoom room, there are people watching and listening. 
but there is a boundary layer there. All they're doing is watching and listening. They can't raise their hand. They can't jump in. Um, that actually is, you know, is a very important distinction. So that's the boundary. And and we're just getting started here in terms of coming up with all these different, you know, elements. Because let me get off screen share for a second just to make my point in a very personal way. So whereas I used to be of the mindset of, hey, let's create a block party. And before the block party, we created the social club at the end of the world. And that was a lot of fun for a while. So like, let's create stuff, you know, and I used to code. It's been a long time since I've coded, um, <clears throat> but I used to love to, hey, well, let's code that, right? And I know like Victor is really into coding and probably half the people in this room are, and I, I love coding. I, I, I just love it. I think it's great. Um, now where I'm at is like, wait a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. Before we do the next big thing, whatever it is, let's, you know, understand and quantify and, and write up kind of the laws of physics of collective intelligence, right? Let's go to the ivory tower. Let's figure out what are these, what are these elements and relationships and fundamental stuff so that whatever we create next is like it. It's not, you know, you know, yet another cool thing that helps us get incrementally there. Let's like really come up with the thing because we've got the Walmart of free stuff and, um, you know, and we're at this moment of extreme urgency. We, we don't really have the luxury of, of uh, evolving little step by little step anymore. It's time to take it all the way. And we're so freaking close. As has been mentioned, there's so many great communities that are out there and there's this emergence and people are coming together organically anyway. I think they just there just needs to be this moment where we we <laughs> in combination with other groups in a decentralized way launch the thing whatever that is and it could just be a meme it could be an idea that spreads and says hey get on twitter and you know tweet out with you know blah 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 you know it could be something as simple as that it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to code something up i'm going to yield to victor awesome yeah uh, I'm Ben. I'm recalling like the synthesis or the antithesis synthesis uh, thesis synthesis. You've got this, like, Victor. Don't worry. You've got it. You've got it. <laughs> oscillation thing that uh, that we were talking about, right? So I'm I'm hearing Jamin Jamin for like seeing you in an oscillation and him on another side of the oscillation, and uh, like I'm seeing that like yeah. So Jamin, when I hear you. I don't think it's about finding the thing. I think it's about finding the next elegant thing and like, uh, and then doing that and then finding the next elegant thing. Oh, Victor, for that, recording, because right? we talk about form and function. Do you want to explain that to Jamin a little bit? Would it be helpful if I like summarize? Please. Well, we just got, yeah. So uh, we was just in a chat with Victor and, and Gavin and um, we came across this we collectively uh came across this this metaphor essentially um between um i was sharing like one of the most valuable things that i've learned from i'm also a programmer from computer science is the concept of decomposition is um in in like the world of philosophy it would be called creating an ontology um or a taxonomy of categories and essentially what it is, is you you take any concept and you break it down into its constituent parts and there's this so that in and of itself is like the most valuable concept i've learned for understanding the world um but at the same time there's this oscillation there's this kind of dichotomy between um the act of breaking things down so you can understand them better and then the act of reintegrating all of that into a lived experience where you're actually doing something there's action happening um and oftentimes people will get stuck on one of the others due to you know past um traumatic experiences or something and um, if i may for the recording can yeah. you explain that or unpack that a little more um well essentially um when something happens we may develop a coping mechanism which is saying um you know i need to analyze the world and in great detail so i understand what will happen 
And this kind of um, is opposed to just being in the world and kind of experiencing it and existing it in like a, a, a grounded base reality level. So, off, I mean, I, I, I do this a lot is it's uh, over, um, over selecting for trying to decompose things as opposed to having a good balance between experiencing things and decomposing to learn more about how the world works and experiencing things so that you can get, uh, you can kind of update to what's important because you can literally take any concept and decompose it infinitely. Um, so having this cycle allows you to experience reality and figure out what's important and what actually matters and then start thinking about okay well what are the the details of this how can i break this down and understand it so i can have a you know whatever my goals are have a, like a more accurate or more successful lived experience so it's this kind of like continuous cycle and depending on people's particular personalities or attachments be it to like um just like being really deep in lived experience and not taking the time to think on a deep level and sort of engage that system to thinking about how things work or being the opposite where ever like constantly in that that system to uh level where you're constantly trying to break things down but not really reintegrating that into a lived experience um so <laughs> i guess i've been explaining this for a little while i just kind of wanted to highlight the concept that um we discussed in the last session and, and i'll hand it back to victor yeah thank you ben so like my takeaway from that is like yeah i mean better to do something than nothing right better to do something like after you know that that uh, that is based on a model of real a sufficiently accurate model of reality and best not to try to overfit the model, right? But to like take the experiment, you know, to to make. Uh, Victor, explain sufficiency. Explain sufficiency for the for the recording. Oh, sufficiency. So, like. Yes, please. I was just in flow there, Mike, and I don't know how to. And I know I'm the worst. I'm the worst. Flow. But sufficiency so, is important to so, explain. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm. Maybe we'll swing back around to it. Like, I want to keep in my flow. So the uh, where I was going was like, so, um, so there, there's like a a, you know, this like learn do learn do like this a cycle, right? Uh, I was what I had heard from you, Jamin, that like kicked off this line of 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 inquiry or like wanting to look at this was like that. Uh, the thing and and trying to reframe it as like the next elegant thing is like for me that's it's like taking the action that can, we can then learn from you now to and then like you know decompose or, or reflect on and then take you know then the next elegant step and here next elegant step and um i'm thinking for me it means something like uh you know, learning, formulating an intention, you know, based off of what you've learned, and taking an, a step to try to manifest what it is that, uh, you know, you, to manifest your intention, and seeing, you know, if you hit or miss, or, you know, if you hit well, then how do you, how do you, like, you know, take the next step to build off of that, right, uh, the, the next, the next intention, uh, uh, like, after it, um, so, yeah, Consequently, having been through a few different uh, like sessions where we were decomposing, I think effectively in, in you know Ben's parlance, like a uh, collective super intelligence, like I'm in sort of like an intention setting mode in order to then just you know to find with you like the next uh, elegant step to manifest like that intention. So an intention that arose for me, you know, in the conversation earlier, I'll, I'll share, which is like that um, collective super intelligence. It's like, yeah, intelligence, intelligence to me, kind of it, uh, it, it's in this sort of like thought mode, 
and I'd express this too, like that, that there's also this sort of like, like the, the action mode. And so like I'm into the collective super intelligence that moves to like collective super action, you know, like the, the coordination thing, right? Uh, yeah. So setting, so I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, as we're, as we're, could we move into like exploring intentions around collective superintelligence with a bias towards like, uh, well, actually, we could do this. Jamin, in a you, you I think, ways. have that based on what Mark was like, saying earlier. Sorry, you know, yeah, where sorry. We, where we look at, at like really far away intentions, right? Which is kind of cool. It's like, you know, high vision. I think we've, we may, maybe we've explored that enough. I don't know. But like, you know, intentions that are that like enable or that are sort of like next steppy or like, you know, that seem uh, or like I feel in my body or like, ah, yeah, well, obviously that's cool. That's right. That intention's right because I know what to do, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, intentions are super useful provided that like they kind of lead to a direct action. You know? Yeah, sorry, Mike, I, I wanted to, to finish that thought. Thank you. You're fine, Victor. Don't worry. Um, Jamin, I wanted you to pick up on what uh, Victor was talking about there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm taken in precisely two kind of directions at this point. One is, you know, this conversation, this weekly podcast is a very important action. One of the most important actions I'm taking in my life right now. And um, conversation is action, right? Um, number one. And then number two, and this gets back to the work we've been developing in the last few days, um, Mike and Marco and I, around, um, you know, beyond conversation itself and beyond collective superintelligence itself as a thing, you know, what do we do with that, right? And that gets to the conversations around uh, book one and book two, which I'll get to in a moment. Um I first, however, just wanted to round out the previous exploration where we're talking about these elements of collective intelligence and all that. Um, I just want to go down as we, like this is supposed to be like a, a taxonomy spanning all the topics in the universe with like the big thick blue lines dividing major sectors and then thinner blue lines, minor sectors all the way to, you know, it's a fractal um, and it goes on forever. Now, one other thing I just want to throw in there is this notion of a population of conversations from a particular model, that being, um, this is just some arbitrary, this blue, big thick blue line here is an arbitrary datum in time. Time is the vertical in this two-dimensional picture. And so a conversation uh, is represented by these green vertical rectangles because they happen in time so like here's whoops uh here's a meeting that's happening here like this little rectangle here and then there's a gap until the next meeting and the next meeting and all that so meetings are represented by these little uh rectangles and um disregard the colors but same situation here. So, so imagine these two yellow skyscrapers with these green meetings embedded within them. This red path um, starting here represents the path of a human being. They're in this meeting. Oh, there's not gonna be another meeting for a while. Well, let me pop over here to this other meeting that's happening. And then this other one over here and this other one over here and da da da. So you can actually look at the trajectory of a human being going through a multitude of conversations. And there's just amazing richness potential in that line of inquiry in and of itself. Let me just throw in one other interesting thing, which is, so you got these two skyscrapers of conversations, these happening very infrequently, these being more frequent and longer, it's all good. But at some point, these two skyscrapers decide to build a sky bridge between them. I could We could call that a mashup conversation. And they build a sky bridge and they build a new skyscraper in the middle of that sky bridge that goes up. And this meeting is the first of that and the second and the third and these go on. And so the big, big picture here is this kind of um, emergent Manhattan skyline 
of parallel conversations and there are sky bridges between them and new con new conversation like this one starts here like this one started at t equals zero they don't all have to start at t equals zero they can start and they can end and you know but but their transcripts li leave on live on their recordings live on and those can be tapped into and for every skyscraper or even individual conversation there can be a bot whose mission in life is to represent that conversation in other conversations and the bot can be queried. Zoom has already integrated that into this very platform that we're on right now, right? The Zoom AI buddy or whatever they call it. Um, so that's all super cool. Okay, so that's all the science of collective intelligence. It's good stuff. Um, now I'm gonna share, share another picture which gets us to, you know, what do we do with collective intelligence? Now this can first be discussed within the Telos conversations, which are, super important. Um, and I'm just going to quickly give an introduction to some of these thoughts that we've been having here. So in addition to collective intelligence itself, you know, let's just, let's go back to the basics of science and engineering. Science. Um, well, what are the big topic spaces here? The, the three most important in my mind to saving and healing life on earth, you've got the heat, the topic of the heat. We need to apply science to the, to the conversation of the heat to understand how what is the rate at which the planet is overheating, you know, how many zeta joules per, you know, month or whatever, or day or whatever are, uh, are, are accumulating, what are the projected impacts of that? How much time do we have, right, to get it, to get a hold of this? How quickly are we literally going to hell? Uh, because we need to know how much time we have. Now, now let's bring in engineering. Now that we've understood the problem, there's only so far you can get understanding the problem. So at some point you have to do something. So enter engineering. The biggest and most important set of engineering solutions to the heat problem right now, given our current realities and constraints that we don't have massive carbon sequestration technology that can, that can operate within the time frame that we're constrained by, uh, enter SRM. It's an acronym for Solar Radiation Management, reflecting a small but significant percentage of sunlight back into space so it never gets absorbed on the planet in the first place. And then has to then and then that heat has to then figure out a way to fight its way through the greenhouse gases, through infrared, blah, blah, blah. Um it's I, I would call it the equivalent in a hospital emergency room of an ice bath if a patient is overheating right you, you and, and they're about to die you don't encourage them to change their diet over the next few weeks because they ain't going to be around but a few more minutes at this rate so you dump them into a giant ice bath srm is the equivalent of a planetary ice bath you forcibly cool the planet uh, because we just can't take the heat anymore so the heat is one big topic space another is food and agriculture um, animal agriculture specifically being the having been historically the main driver of planetary overheating by over 80% of the overheating can be directly attributed to animal agriculture. Um, so let's talk about food and let's talk about um, industrial agriculture. Um, now there's a really interesting vicious cycle here. The heat is destroying our ability to grow food. And as I just mentioned, the way that we do food has been the major contributor to the heat. Um, and both of which, both the heat and the way we do food is destroying the biosphere, our own habitat, et cetera. So book one, science and engineering focuses on, on these three mega topics. And we ultimately get to solutions where the rubber hits the road. SRM in the case of heat, food healers in the case of food, basically making food, uh, plant-based, super nutritious, delicious plant-based food. Uh, a basic human right from time to time. Like if I turn off my camera, you'll see um, a picture of the community cafe. That was a precursor to food healers. Um, but anyway, I, I'm just giving an overview right now. So we'll get into de details later. So book one, science and engineering. Let's understand what's going on, what is most urgent and what can actually be done about it. Book two. So if book one is about science and engineering, molecules, jewels, atoms, stuff like that, biology. Uh, book two is about human stuff, the ultimate human revolution, because if no humans are paying attention to the aforementioned, I might as well just be talking to myself in the bathroom mirror. Um, how do we get humanity 
to engage in this emergent revolution. Anyway, here's a quick summary of book one. Food healers itself is um, the beginning of what I call the liberation bridge, where we liberate ourselves from the daily considerations and ongoing considerations of money, because if you want to eat, you got to have money. Uh, if you want to have money, you got to chop down the last mahogany tree and kill the last pollinator and milk the honey out of it and sell it on the open market. So you get money so you can buy, oops, well, there's no more honey, but whatever else we can get to eat, etc. We need to liberate ourselves from money, from greed, from hoarding, from ego. Um, collective human intelligence, these kinds of conversations, I find them extremely liberating because here we do the Vulcan mind meld. Nobody's making money in the process. Um, we kind of get to forget about the rest of life for a couple of hours <laughs> and then dive in here. So it's kind of temporary liberation. Food healers is much more real, tangible liberation where we make food a basic human right and demonetize food and de-animalize food. Um, and once we get into collective human intelligence, as more and more people are liberated to the extent that they can actually jump into these conversations and set aside the other aspects of life, however real or man-made, man-made in the case of money, um, we can then co-create the ultimate game, um, which there's another acronym here, saving, healing, and transforming life on earth. That for me is the telos. That's the order of the day. It's the only game in town at this moment in history, because we're so close to the edge of extinguishing all life on earth. So here's where we talk about what I mentioned earlier was the, the ultimate course correction. We're currently on a, on a highway to hell um, and we need to find the off-ramp to that and the on-ramp to this new highway to heaven on earth. And uh, lots more to talk about all the above, but I just wanted to at least just give that overview and I'm gonna pass the feather to whoever wants it. So can you, can you connect this back to collective intelligence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, um, within within the image that I just showed, the images, there is collective human intelligence, right? But we first, what I'm basically saying is enough of us need to become liberated and enlightened enough. Enough victors need to stop looking for the next, you know, program manager job or tech job or whatever and say, hey, I want to meet with people like me and talk about these things, right? But again, liberation. Um, we need liberation. Um, and having enough money is not necessarily liberation by the addictive nature of money. Um, Jamin, when you're ready, uh, and again, Ben is our eager uh, stand-in for the audience, but when yeah, you're ready, you move to book two, yeah. my friend. Well, no, no, I already have. Here is book two. This is book two, The Ultimate Human Revolution. No, I know. I understand where you're going, but like, take your time. Okay. Well, I, I, don't, I, I just want to answer Ben's question and then punt it back. Um, but collective human intelligence is right here. It's central to this whole story of book one and book two. From liberation, we spend more time in conversation as more and more of humanity forms this planetary universal mega brain. Um, we go from collective human intelligence to collective super intelligence, where we're able to uh, synthesize, co-create identify solutions that may have been sitting on the shelf for years, but for lack of collective super intelligence, we weren't properly able to bubble those to the top. In fact, money actually, in, in terms of bubbling stuff to the top, money actually has an effect of reversing gravity, right? And so, whereas we should all be talking about SRM and urgently implementing SRM to save life on earth, instead, what we have ended up doing is putting all this focus on green tech, um, which is great. It's just, it's kind of like going to the guy who's overheating. His, his body's at 107 degrees Fahrenheit and climbing in the emergency room. And instead of dipping him in the ice bath, which is the only thing that can save him at this point, somebody's talking with him about holistic nutrition, which he can't even hear because he's, his mind is practically gone at this point from the overheating. So uh, that, all that is is a very crude analogy to say that we've been distracted from what is truly important. Um, you know, the stuff of book one and the collective human intelligence of book two uh, by 
money, moneyed interests. I've literally had character assassination attacks levied against me uh, by folks who are deeply invested monetarily in green tech, right? Because we've been disruptive. We were, James and I and Marco and others were there at COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland two years ago, and we were touted by the British media as the runaway success of COP26. I was there in my Darth Vader uniform with a nice sound system, singing Spanish love songs. We had 10 huge posters with actual solutions to global warming and the destruction of the biosphere, and whereas everyone else is just doing blah, blah, blah. So like clockwork, I started getting attacked, <laughs> right? Which is a really good sort of indication of success. Um, but why am I going off track? Yeah. Money has reversed gravity in terms of the best ideas bubbling to the top. Money assassinates some of the greatest ideas if they threaten somebody's source of profit. Talking about value, right, Jamie? Value? Right, like how we how we evaluate. I know I'm throwing you back on like I'm trying to give you a curveball here, Jamie. And especially well, you're you succeeding. And, ben and anyone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so so it, like how we evaluate our attention, like attention merchants, value, money, whatever you want to like, anything like in that range. And, and this is like the idea of valuation. This is not the stock market. This is the idea kind of stuff. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe I threw everyone for a loop, so I apologize for that. No, that's that was okay. not, my, not my purpose. That, that's okay. That's okay. But anyway, wh where I'm going is we need a you know, one of the elements of collective human intelligence that we need to really be mindful of and, and cultivate is that of purity, right? Not uncorruptibility. Um, because right now money has been corrupting. So on that? yeah, go ahead. Can you expand on that? What What is purity? Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, purity in terms of truth, protecting the truth and not letting um, monetary interests influence um the the pursuit of truth um and uh you know I, I just think of my own experiences you know i president former mexican president vicente fox and i you know took on the prohibition of cannabis and we gained tremendous traction we were all over the news you may have even heard the news going back 10 years or so a little over 10 years ago and um like clockwork i started getting death threats from criminal drug cartels and, you know, speaking of the climate stuff, I've gotten character assassinations attempts made against me because of the work that we've done around climate and bringing up the truth of the matter. The tr part of the truth is the urgency. A lot of people are very uncomfortable hearing the urgency because it takes the focus of people away from, you know, buying a Tesla or putting solar panels on the roof, thinking they're doing the right thing. And they are, that's all great but it doesn't address the urgency. The only thing that addresses the urgency is solar radiation management, which is something most people have never heard of, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so money reverses gravity in terms of the best ideas bubbling to the top, right? Um, and so in terms of us co-creating collective human intelligence and collective super intelligence we just need to be very mindful of the bad guys because they're very real and their you know their their guns are and bullets are very real mm -hmm. i feel like there's another social factor in there as well in terms of um we have a society that is uh really good at pointing out problems but not good at completing the, the cycle of like identify problem you know think about solution try solution see what works scale it up identify a new problem like we just kind of stop at the identifying problem <laughs> stage and so um i feel like a lot of the sentiment at least what i what i've heard from people um around the sort of urgency aspect of the climate issue is that um they know they're they're aware of it they they know you know they may not know all the stats or anything but they 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 have heard many many people telling them that this is an issue but all of the like 
across all every discussion of every major problem in our society there's there's no the cycle never completes it's always just like oh there's a problem there's a problem there's a problem and you know where do you go from there so i, I think um if you if you can you know like you created an ontology for um for the the collective uh human super intelligence and that helps us understand it and then we can distribute the collective human super intelligence uh like little technologies package so more groups can adopt them and connect their conversations together um maybe there's another aspect of like how do you how do you bake in um affordances of of action of actually doing things of completing the cycle because if all of your collective conversations are about we have a problem and none of the collective conversations are about okay well how do we solve this problem that doesn't get us too far either no and and no one here is advocating for that everyone is you know first identify the problem and then solutioneering coming up with solutions promoting those getting the getting support for those scaling them up etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. right yeah i guess I'm, my question is like how do you bake in into into this process how do you bake in affordances that lead they like inherently compensate for the 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 current kind of direction if everybody's being pulled towards you know talking about problems not talking about solutions how do you bake in the affordances into this process that you're creating to share with people so that they're more likely to complete the cycle yeah i think it's automatic if we're if we're true to the truth and true to the principles of collective human intelligence, you know, once it's, you know, heaven forbid the house should catch on fire, but once I have awareness of it, I'm not just going to say, you know what, the house is on fire and probably in five minutes, it'll be burnt to the ground and we'll all be dead. And that's really interesting. Let's talk about that for another, I don't know, two hours, right? No, no. Uh, I, call 911, get, you know, get the kids out of the house, the dog, you know, get the... <laughs> get the fire department here i mean it's the obvious you know follow-on so i i do understand the syndrome it but... seems obvious to you it seems obvious to you but i don't think it is to a lot of people because that, that's what i'm seeing in society right now is everybody's sitting in the in the house and they're like oh that's not fire like that wow we should tell people about it. It, it exactly exactly see but you see what you're looking at is and analyzing is not collective super intelligence and that's why it's so important that we go from Business as usual, conversation as usual, conversation is a pastime, conversation to virtuous signal. Hey, I care, I care, I'm a caring person. Am I gonna get laid tonight? You know, am I gonna get hired uh, by whoever? <laughs> I care, I care, you know, virtuous signaling, you know, this is it's not about virtuous signaling. It's about solutioneering and getting these solutions implemented. Um, anyway, James has had his hand up for a while, followed by Victor. So I pass the feather to to James. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, uh, nice to meet you anyway, Ben. I didn't get a chance to speak to you there earlier, man. So thanks for coming in. You know, nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, look, I I think it's um, we're getting somewhere as far as I'm concerned here. But you know, we're all right in the sense, and we're because we're all heading in the same directory or direction, right? So we have uh, we have a similar goals or goal or goals. In, you know, so. The fact that we're having the conversation will help us to understand it and to do, you know, define it, and then the actions come once we've figured out, defined, and you know, we've come up with solutions. The actions follow us too. So I think it's good. I think it's fair to uh, to like acknowledge to acknowledge first anyway of or give some example of what your question. How how does that happen? We just said Jim and started the block party here back in twenty twenty. We started it. In February, and um, it's just a group of ourselves, people like ourselves, now who have been genuinely, I suppose, uh, they're aware of their situation in the world. They're aware of the world's predicament. We said, so to speak, they're aware that unless we, as a you know, as a species, come together, we have the so called a lot of people refer to us as the, the shepherds of the planet, so to speak. So uh, others say we created the mess. There's only us that can, uh, un, you know, undo it. Like so, the point is. People come because they're interested in the conversation. A lot of the conversations then will bifurcate. This in the bifurcation of the conversations that the solution first and foremost the com the, the problems the predicaments are defined and and then the you know conversations break off into breakout rooms and 
we bring in scientists and uh, different experts in their fields in regard to some of the per the predicaments that we find ourselves in. I think it's it's uh, for the audience that would be viewing this, it's, it's uh, important for us to put up a few links with this video as well in regards to what is SRM. I mean, uh, solar radiation management is not something or a figment of our imagination by any means. It's going back to research that started back in the 1970s by a Cork professor here by, uh, by the name of Sean Toomey. After his death, uh, he done a lot of uh, groundbreaking work a lot of words for his research in the cloud, re, re, you know, the reflectivity of clouds. And his work was followed on. And now later on, the engineering side of that work as as to what, what can we, you know, we build in order to implement um, the natural processes that happen in our atmosphere, in, in our, you know, with cloud reflectivity, reflecting the sun's uh, rays, we say. Um, so the radiation man management came up. Professor Stephen Salter uh, from Cambridge University, he's come on to, uh, come on to the uh, block party numerous times. We've uh, promoted his work in the COP26 as well when we were over there. Um, but basically, it's basically building autonomous, non-fuel-powered -power, uh, ships, autonomous ships that were, uh, we say, drones that produce um, fine mist spray from ordinary seawater through these filters that spray the seawater, which in itself is, um, you know, non-harmful or anything else. And the natural convection of the heat of the oceans brings a certain amount of these, uh, we say, eight, eight to nine nanometer uh, droplets of water, which each contain um, a nucleus of one salt crystal, are brought up higher into the atmosphere where they form clouds, but these clouds are known to be brighter clouds because of the salt crystals with them. There's no pollution from, from we say, a few fossil fuels. Therefore, we get dark clouds in the cities because the fossil fuels create pollution. The, they're the, nu the nucleus of our clouds is, is fossil fuels and dirt. Basically, our clouds are dirty, opposite in the, so in the oceans. Anyway. What I'm saying, I don't want to go into the science of it too much. What I'm saying is we've had a number of people here, experts in the fields of solar radiation management, including Professor Stephen Salter. We should put links for his videos. And it's it's the it's understanding our predicaments, which will create the conversations. And out of the conversations will come the, the, the uh, solutions and the actions. And that's basically the, what we're proposing in, in a nutshell, as far as I'm concerned. We have, we just say a handful of, Predic worldly predicaments basically that we're feeling facing and a lot of them are man majority man-made and it can be uh, tackled within reason if we act now and you're right the governments don't know they're well aware of the situations they don't know we've had another expert on from a great friend of ours um from the you know the european union from uh, you know the um Basically, from the EU, that our his basic work is it involves, you know, looking for these problems and seeing if we can come up with solutions. He's talked to world leaders all over the world, and his last talk with uh, one of Obama's main uh, science advisors, the man turned around and said to him, "We know the problem, we do not know what to do with it. About it, we might as well be juggling chickens and chainsaws." That is basically what his answer was to the, to to a friend of ours. Now, the point I'm making is that they're saying they don't know the problem. And again, this is because we look, what we, let's put all the different predicaments. We say there's a handful of predicaments and let's put them all into one, one name. We're all aware of the name apocalypse. And the true meaning of apocalypse is the lift, lifting of the veil. And that's what we're talking about here. The lifting of the veil, the, you know, the truth of our predicaments coming out. When people are more aware of our predicaments, then they're more inclined to get involved in the conversations in order to try and do something to tackle the conversations. So awareness is key in order to create the, moment, the, the, you know, the want for the conversations. And... We need to have the spaces for those conversations, the platforms built for those conversations, the AI ready to deal with those conversations. A lot of them are already taking place and some of them are floating out there, as you said, Ben, but are not enough is what we're saying. And none of them are connected. None of them. All we're asking is basically is for everybody who's interested and inclined to get into conversation with like minded people like themselves who are unconcerned about whether it's something in their community or a global issue, micro or macro. The point is that they're concerned about the issue and they are already having the conversations. There's no big ask, as Mike said a while ago, 
all we're asking really is a census for us to have um system set up for the connection of the connection and cross pollination of all of those conversations because out of those conversations uh, will come solutions collective solutions not uh, no decentralized solutions where we can all agree on them and take the appropriate actions and in, also to lift the veil of you know of the real truth of what's facing us majority of the planet one percent of the planet really is only aware of the real truth of what's happening with a lot of the situations mainly climate change and that is the biggest of our adversaries more the most of the world is focused on the world war at the moment no possibility of a world war but that is just a symptom of our biggest adversary which is climate change that world war is being fought now for vital resources to sustain who the winners because they know as you said the governments know of the impending predicament we're in globally as a result of climate change. They are know, they are aware, they're juggling chainsaws and chickens because they don't know what to do about it. So the second thing they can think of is self-preservation. And in order to do that, you need, for your country to run, you need the, you need the power and you need food and you need water and the vital minerals. So it's a resource war that's happening in the world today. It's nothing to do with politics or religion or anything else. It's to do with self-preservation at this stage. And the veil hasn't been lifted on the truth of that to the people. And until the people understand that, that we're all facing the predicament together, but there's only a chosen few who have kept this veil over our eyes and are, are misleading us to think that these problems can be solved politically or with wars or whatever, they're still keeping the, the veil over our eyes as to the true predicament. And until we're aware of that, we'll never collectively come together. And until we don't do that and provide the platforms and the technology for all of those conversations to cross pollinate, we'll get nowhere except for where we're heading now, which is as Jim puts it, a trajectory to hell. I'll pass the further there with that. Yeah, thank you for that, James. That uh that was a lot. Uh, what I were, what I was, I wanted to acknowledge what you're pointing at is uh, as a veil, right? Uh, yeah, I, and you know, at at some level, like what that translates to to me is like that, um, the kind of sense making that uh, that. Is required in order to accurately diagnose problems and to uh, devise effective solutions and to create the conditions for um, manifesting those solutions. Like, like since it's the at some at some level, where there's like at the root, like the sense making and coordination. You know that uh, you know to do that. However, like it's not just climate change; it's also like you know exponential you know, technology. It's the crisis in sense making itself. It's the uh, you know the um, there's there's like a uh, uh, the 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 diagnosis that uh, that. Um, that I've found that I think best articulates the conditions we're in uh, are are using two two terms like right? um, poly crisis to you know which includes like yes and climate change uh, the 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 warming uh, it, the the you know growth of exponential technology creating the conditions whereby like um uh it's possible for uh you know power to be placed in the hands of a, a very few people to uh, to to like have um and to be like for that power to be you know grossly asymmetric uh you know within within the human like landscape like there's that's sort of uh, and, and I'm kind of botching it, I think, but like there's, it's not just one crisis. It's not just the climate crisis. It's like multiple, multiple crises. And then the other word uh, beyond poly crisis is like meta crisis, like the, the concept that like, you know, 
uh, underlying all these different crises, which they they cannot be really solved uh, independent uh, independently. Solving the the climate crisis is not going to inherently like enable enable good sense making. Uh, solving the climate crisis is not going to you know address the the challenges of of exponential tech uh, uh, exponentially um, powerful technology or any of the other crises. So that's like uh, the meta crisis is like there's some yeah there's there's generator functions of those those crises. So yes, absolutely need to solve those crises the, the ind individual crises and hey. Well, like the idea of solve is kind of weird. Like it's a, uh, uh, I'm, I'm noticing a discomfort with that with that word. But so, how to create the conditions, you know, where we are able to e effectively coordinate in order to solve all of these problems in a condition where, like, everyone is in that kind of. Uh, what you'd pointed to James, uh, James as like a self-preservation kind of a mode. There's like this, this you know, you, you can't like, you know, uh, wage peace while preparing for war, kind of a kind of a thing, right? So, for me, coming into this space, like with this sort of frame of meta crisis and poly crisis, which um, if uh, if those terms are are new for for anyone here, anyone listening, I encourage you to look those up. There's good you know good concise resources to uh, um, to get a better introduction to those frames uh, than than I've I've been able to provide. But like uh, I think you know my interest in being here is that like I think that the that collective superintelligence points towards like Part of the condition for uh, addressing you know, the challenges of our time. I completely agree. Um, I wanted to, to also shift back to Jamin's comments and the, the, the back and forth between Jamin and Ben, which um, served to clarify something for me. And, and Ben, like I think, uh, like I, uh, I've, I've, I've brought a similar question into the space, which is like, yeah, it's. It's not just collective superintelligence because you have to do, and I mentioned that earlier too. And I think that the reason that like I stu I've, I've stumbled on that is that I have this um this sense of a uh, a di dichotomy or a dualism or you know a separation of like cognition and like embodied action, right? Um, and so for me like thinking of intelligence, I map it to like cognition and uh, and like knowing as opposed to doing. What I'm hearing from uh, from Jamin, you know, in his re response was like, well, that for him, intelligence is like inherently action oriented because, you know, if uh, you're intelligent and in a birding uh, house, then simply the cognitive action of diagnosing the fact that the house is burning and devising like solutions to it, it uh, inherently implies the action taken to uh, uh, in, in light of you know that accurate diagnosis. So I'll, I will uh, I'm, I'll, I'm, I'm now holding uh, you know at least in this space that collective superintelligence is uh, like inherently inclusive of um, uh, collective super action or you know, whatever that 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 previous uh, previous fr uh, phrase was um, yeah so I just wanted to to share like how I'm processing what I'm what I'm hearing and um, putting the feather back uh, could I just quickly respond to that because uh, I, like I first I just want to clarify like when I brought up the climate change, I I, I did say like just to, uh, to simplify it, picking one thing like climate change that was something that we tackled here on SRM, and we had a number of experts on the block party. I suppose the main point of what or the essence of what I was trying to say is that it's not the only thing, obviously, and it's not our only predicament. We've also tackled the food issues and other other major issues. We've uh, we've even dealt with non um 
non um existential things such as just the the actual um uh, communication side of it um you know making it uh, our, our um our work with the indigenous nations and everything we've done a lot o over the last three years through this block party and through these collective meetings and putting our minds together and meeting new peoples and you know figuring out ways to put our conversations into action and there's many sub subjects and of course Victor you're right it is you know poly crisis it's all that and um, I'm not saying it's just uh, climate change as well I've said but I was just choosing that as one particular thing because we had a number of experts on for that as we did for food and and the indigenous nations and everything else but what I'm saying is out of just just one conversation and this group here like we have achieved a lot over the last year and made a lot of connections and done a lot of good and it's just a simple example of one conversation here and what the people that came together in this room had achieved over the last three years. And what Jamin is saying is, and Gerald Ben is saying as well, that surely, and we know there are other groups out there who are collectively working for and finding their own, you know, um, you know, their own crises or whatever it is they're focused on. It doesn't even have to be crises. But I'm saying if the conversations, we're not saying they have to be even about poly crisis. Jamin is saying all conversations are welcome because we, we know ourselves that, you know, answers can come from the strangest of quarters. But once all these conversations are kind of hyper connected and linked, that's when the answers will become available, even to those who are not aware that they came from a conversation that happened that has has light years away from the actual topic of conversation of what you're talking about or working on. And yet the answer you were seeking could come from something that is so abstract, you would never have found it in your lifetime or a million lifetimes. It's only because of these conversations being hyper connected and linked and, you know, that that, that those those possibilities can arise is what I'm saying. That's what I said. I'll leave it at that. Ah, okay. I appreciate that. I I'm I think that uh, that my my hearing you was partially indexed on seeing the, the book one, book two framing and seeing the like you know, focus on on you know veganism and uh uh and the focus on, on climate, which, you know, uh I'm certainly not going to discount at all, but uh, it, it led me to hear like, ah, the climate crisis is like the preeminent uh, like challenge of our times. Like, I don't think that that's a given. And I wanted to, to ensure that like, you know, we have a, um, a, that we're holding the whole, you know, of, uh, of, of the situation and yeah, inclusive of, um, you know, the, uh, the climate crisis. Yeah, well, it's a uh, it's a lot a lot of different uh, crises crises to account for, and and I think the the unifying factor is that all of these um, things we're experiencing are anthropocentric. They're um, all human based and we're all experiencing them through our own perceptions as humans which are are biased in certain ways and subject to certain limitations um for example we can't hold a million things in our memory at once and access them all accurately and this is why i think the sense making issue is 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 one of the more fundamental uh things to pull on it sounds like the affordances that are, are being we're discussing about building around the collective super intelligence around like interconnecting the conversations is providing um sense making capabilities to people they can now see um there's now a more of an interconnection of the information and um so i i think Personally, my thesis is that sense making is is the string to pull in order to help, because no no individual is going to solve any of these problems on their own. Um, so, like collectively enhancing people's sense making abilities, I I think are is 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 critical, and this is why I'm interested in in disseminating different sense making tools. Um, and I think one of the things that maybe has like emerged through these conversations is um is jamin's like 
use of these visual artifacts during the conversations. And I, I think that's super critical. I, I'm a big proponent of a technique I call Wardley, or that, that's called Wardley mapping. I don't call it that. Everybody calls it that, but it's called Wardley mapping. Um, it's a it's a tool for sense making involves creating visual diagrams of value chains um, combined with the technical technological evolution of each component in the value chain. Um, but I think that the, the underlying principle is that the the human mind is only capable of of storing you know four to seven concepts in short term memory at any time, and all of the problems we're talking about are um super complex they have they have tons of moving parts they're all interconnected and complex systems that are all uh, affecting each other and so i feel like that really the the only way to make progress is to have conversations and augment those conversations with some type of additional memory um be that like a transcript that records all the topics that are being discussed or some sort of visual diagramming be it like mind mapping be it sketching be it drawing connections some sort of way to record the concepts in the conversation and inter interrelate them so that um people are actually able to reason about these complex problems because i've seen so many times i've been in conversations where um we're all talking about a problem. It's like, oh no, this is this is the main issue we need to focus on. And then somebody else is like, oh no, this this is the issue we need to focus on. And that goes around in the circle. And because it's a complex problem with you know hundreds of of issues, by the time we get to five or six of them, we've forgotten the first ones we were talking about. And if we're recording this collectively in some sort of visual artifact, we can see where we've gone in the conversation. We can loop back if necessary. We can uh, we can augment things if if uh, you know if somebody brings up uh, another topic. We can interrelate those. We can draw connections and lines between all the different concepts. And um, I think in terms of the solutioning that it's like inherent an inherent behavior of once people have made sense, they automatically come to some sort of action items or some sort of solutions. Um, I think as humans that occurs naturally, but I feel like uh, because of this exponential technology thing, uh, these these devices we're using are, are dissociating us from our embodied cells and making it, it's essentially training us to not act, uh, or or to act in ways that that are feel like acting but aren't acting. Um, and so I think we need to, because we're, we're we're creating we're creating social social socio technologies, which are technologies that run on the. Um, like the group level, the collective level. So like a meeting procedure, like the instructions for how, how to meet, we have an agenda, we all show up, we talk about the items, we make action items, and then we we end the meeting. Like that is a socio-technology that we record the procedure. Now we can send that to other people and they can follow the same procedure. It's not a, a, a digital device. When most people think of technology, they think of like a phone or a, a microwave or something, but the, this concept of a procedure that you can write down and run and then iterate on and improve, that's what a technology is. Uh, so we're creating these socio-technologies that have inherent affordances. Um, let's say in a in our meeting agenda, we, we make it so that everybody has to introduce themselves. Well, that's going to create a particular dynamic in the meetings. So what can we do when we're creating these socio-technologies to inbuild an inherent sense of action so the full OODA loop is completed? So it's not just um, free form where anything can happen, but we specifically bake in certain procedures that allow this sort of action-taking, direct action to emerge um, 
because I don't because of the other factors I think in like technology and stuff I think there's there's factors that are pulling us away from that there's factors that are just pulling us away pulling us towards actions that are not very impactful and when we're designing something we can bake in affordances purposefully that create emergent effects and I think maybe we could like focus on how are we going to do that so I guess I guess to wrap it up in, in summary is I think the sense making issue is probably the the thread to pull at least for me it makes the most sense because that's like empowering the whole collective to start coming up with their own solutions and I think the visual artifacts allow us to reason about more than a few concepts and all the problems we're trying to solve are complex so we need to do that and I think us designing these socio technologies we need to figure out how to bake in affordances that compensate for certain other things that that are trending like technology like social media all this this kind of runaway technology effect beautiful beautiful so what what i was hearing was you know a lot was focused on the lens of the individual meeting right and where is that meeting going over time and you know what are we what agreements are we coming to in the over the course of the meeting um that was just one element that i got um but so let me um uh bring up again this picture of you know this universe this universe of conversations creating i don't know if you call it a universal brain or whatever but or collective super intelligence where um Mike and I the other day were running some scenarios and, you know, what if there were, what if, you know, 1% of humanity spent exactly one hour per week on average in, you know, one or more of these conversations? Um, well, 1% of humanity is 80 million people. Um, if you divide that one percent into those 80 million people into 168 hours in a week um you have uh whatever ha half a million um people per hour in conversation and if there's eight people per conversation on average you have you know i don't know something like sixty thousand uh or so conversations happening and every hour of every week just with that very thin rate of participation right so now think of those 60,000 ongoing conversations as spanning um you know all these different uh uh topic spaces right so you know we could just um I won't carve up this picture into myriad topic spaces, but you can imagine it, right? And so, you know, maybe 5% of those conversations are focused on global warming, 5% on stopping, preventing, de-escalating war and international conflict, right? Another 5% on uh, the runaway tech and AI and all the threats that those present, et cetera. So what comes to mind, I, I worked at Microsoft for a number of years, and from time to time, I would think about this problem or that other problem facing the company. Um, I did risk management as one of my jobs, and then I was in corporate strategy. And so I'd have to look at a lot of different things. Um, the good news is with enough people participating, you have whole sectors of this planetary brain working on one problem or another and in that way all of these problems get addressed in parallel and there can be whole sectors of the brain you know something analogous to like a frontal cortex that basically assimilates what's coming to it from all the other sectors of the brain and does some kind of high level prioritization you know what are the 10 mega problems we need to focus on right now with urgency and for each of those 10 what are the top three mega solutions for each and how do we basically you know 
do some kind of grand synthesis and figure out where we need to direct resources. It could be that certain sectors of the brain uh, don't have enough firepower in them. Well, let's blow a whistle, signal, like we talked about this uh, signaling over here. Let's send out the signal that we need more, more brains on that in that sector to help figure out whatever needs to be figured out, including what solutions we need to implement right now. Now, one of the things that is emergent, one of the many things that's emergent from this framework of uh, a planetary brain is that um, this would, I believe, constitute a new form of governance. And Buckman, and according to the Buckminster Fuller paradigm of, you know, don't try to attack an old, obsolete, or destructive technology, create a new system, a new thing that makes the old system obsolete, right? And so I think over time, you know, just as you know, Bitcoin is making the U.S. dollar and other fiat currencies gradually obsolete. Um, it's a very gradual process. This sort of planetary brain, this planetary collective superintelligence could make, um, I'll just say, fiat governments over time increasingly obsolete. Um, and in fact, I can imagine this brain coming up with brilliant marketing campaigns that get you know, one candidate or another elected over the others. And in fact, what about those candidates who ride on a ticket of collective superintelligence? I'm going to do what the collective superintelligence <laughs> says, right? I'm I'm but, a, you know, a clerk, an administrator carrying out the wishes of the collective superintelligence. That's one form of a sort of an ideal that we could aspire to. So for me, in a way, it all comes back to collective superintelligence because collective superintelligence can solve the poly crisis uh, holistically. And with that, I pass the feather. Okay. Yeah. So, Jamin, I I feel like I'm I'm seeing the picture you're painting of collective superintelligence. I feel like I understand, you know, your your focus on it, and like the uh, the the sense for what you see as possible to accomplish um, with the conditions of collective superintelligence. I uh, I also am seeing, and I really appreciate Ben, like. Your, uh, your your contributions around um, to the conversation around like uh, sociotech and uh, I you know because I share context with you like I I I grok that like I uh, and like I there's a version of like you know my grokking it which is like I've been in meetings that uh, were a complete waste. And I've been in meetings where like, wow, you know, it actually did the doing by having the meeting, right? So like I, I have a, a sense of, of um, you know, direct experience and trust that like, you know, you're right, Shane, that, that this, uh, that the collective superintelligence as comprised of uh, individual conversations focused on particular problem domains or domains of action that like totally get it and also there's a, a version of that that looks like um sort of a a gradual almost like brownian motion sort of you know gradient where like the the action and uh, the intelligence, you know, moves action in sort of a gradual fashion. I'm seeing in what Ben's pointing at that, like, with the locus of action, you know, of in the intelligence being within individual meetings or conversations, and with this observation that there's more or less effective ways of operating, you know, those meetings and conversations an opportunity, right, to create the conditions where like, yeah, you've got the socio-tech of the meeting in which like the intelligence, the, the sense-making, the intelligence, the action like just happens like pretty uh, like effortlessly. Like I I love that uh, 
that as a vision on top of the collective superintelligence of like it just happens. And I think that the the just happens is sort of a combination of this sort of overarching distributed uh you know Dutch 42 you know scenario and in with with in baking the you know the uh the action orientation through like uh a you know well devised sociotech that folks can use within the meetings so that you know the information that's coming in, say across this distributed network of uh, of conversations, like is processed appropriate uh, and uh, and you know action taken. I, I wanted to uh, to like to throw that in. So I think it's like a com. There's a there's like a, a yes uh, like a both and kind of you know thing happening for me. Like looking at it that you're sharing, sure looking at them share the. Uh, the other bit that I wanted to to throw out, to throw in, and the like, the reason why I had uh, invited um, Jake Cousins to join last week, and pity that he couldn't, was because when we had had a conversation around this, uh, he was like totally vibing with the collective superintelligence thing, and out popped from his mind, like a version of the collective superintelligence that is sort of, you know, if you squint, looks like what you're talking about and bakes in the uh, the action orientation in it. And I've been noodling on that, uh, um, like uh, I've been noodling on it and with this additional piece of like uh, action oriented in meeting sociotech, like I, I it, it comes a little bit clearer like how this all fits together. So <clears throat> the, the the like his his version of it was like imagine 24 hour ongoing conversations right but each one its own right and your idea here of like you know pop in for an hour and make a contribution and then dip well you know if you look at that in uh the way that that would happen likely because we have like you know a um a spherical globe on which people live and there's things like time zones you can imagine like people popping into the conversations roughly on sort of like you know a way uh, a time that matches their time zones and so if you step back and, and look at all of these you can imagine sort of like a participation curve right moving around the globe right of uh and so it's like the yeah <laughs> it, it, it gavin was kind of like has this uh idea of doing a global wave and I'm like oh yeah like a global participation wave and collective super intelligence moving around the globe again and again and again and again where like the the, the intelligence and action are just sort of in a continuous motion and like what would what would the conditions need to be where that by that manifested where like i could jump into the conversation make a contribution and dip out and then just do that again and again well i would probably have to trust the process man like you jump in you trust the process you trust that the information that you're being presented with is like accurate and good and comprehensive and that the um the actions derived are like trustworthy and that you can do them and you can do them because you are in the right thread of conversations right this is it's the one for you where you can do your thing right? yeah so I'll, I'll put the feather back thanks guys You're muted, Ben. I don't know if you're trying to talk. I I was muted. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I think I think collective superintelligence is the way. I think I'm in agreement with that. Um, I'm also thinking about each kind of if we have our like our ontology of of uh, parts uh, that go into to make this thing. We've got like the individuals. We've got 
the conversations that form. And then we've got the network of those conversations. Um, I, I'm looking at it as like all of those parts are running an operating system of uh, a particular way of operation. And all of those can be looked at like a technology and iterated on and improved on. And so going to the conversation level, you've got your participants, but they come together and they form this new sort of ethereal entity called a conversation. And how those participants choose to hold that conversation, what are the meta rules? What are the rules of the conversation? Um, do we, you know, do we take turns talking? Do we all talk at like at the same time? Um, what what is uh, in context? What is it in the scope of the conversation? Are we allowed to talk about anything? Are we focusing on just this particular thing? Um, how do we uh, how do we record this? Are we just gonna remember it? Are we gonna write it down? Are we gonna create artifacts? Um, all of those go to build the operating system for that particular conversation that materializes when the people come together. And um, I think something that that uh, Victor and Stephen Fan and I are working on is that kind of operating system for when the conversational context is formed in order to, you know, one, um, feel amazing when it's happening and two, be like super generative and three, have this like ongoing memory so we can pick up our conversations later and bring other people into it. Um, and this is maybe kind of ties into what Victor was talking about. If we have this wave of people in different time zones coming online for uh, conversations as it's kind of going around the world, well, all those people need a way to get up to speed with what they missed uh, for the time where they weren't participating in it. Um, this is uh, something I face working in distributed organizations all the time. I'm currently in an organization that has employees in 100 and, 112 countries or something like that. Um, and it's it's how how do you get up to speed if everything's distributed if, if like some people are sleeping while other people are working how do you continually update and get up to speed and I think having these processes to record the conversation and certain artifacts like visual representations and graphs or like Miro boards or something is is um it helps facilitate that it helps solve that problem um so I guess yeah I just the main framing is like yeah I think uh collective intelligence is the way and i think if we also design the operating systems for the individuals and the conversations that emerge and it sounds like you've been doing a lot of talking about the kind of operating system for the network of the conversations um there's a lot of ways to like supercharge that if we if we you know it just getting people to come together and talk in collective and inform collective super intelligences like super beneficial but we can multiply that if we um you know iterate on all of those different operating systems at all those different levels um and it's obviously it's up for people to choose which what they want depending on the context of like how they're feeling what they want to do um yeah super inspirational thanks yeah i'm i'm, I'm super happy i uh, <laughs> Uh, to participate and and learn about this, and I, I love your uh, your diagrams, Jamin. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, feel free to stick around. Uh, no one's there's no pressure for sticking around, and that's one of the rules of these conversations, particularly the twenty four hour block party. People are encouraged to come and go as they please, and um, you know, uh, you you hit on a bunch of really interesting points. Um, one of which I'll use the word culture you know what is the culture of a conversation here we have a certain culture that new people kind of get by osmosis and they get into the flow and they say hey wow this works and it works obviously works for all of us i imagine hypothetically someone else having a conversation where it's brooklyn culture where people interrupt each other because that's what we do in brooklyn we interrupt each other yeah yeah you know great you know more power to brooklyn and brooklyn style conversations 
I'm not into interrupting people or being interrupted, uh, though I do tolerate it. Sometimes it's called for like you, Mike kind of interrupts from time to time. I tolerate that, you know, and then he apologizes, you know, so it's, it's interruptions with, within reason. So, you know, um, rigid rules, uh, I'm kind of wary of those fuzzy rules. I'm kind of more into that. And, but what I'm really talking about here is, so within this decentralized universe, each conversation itself has a center, Right. And that center is typically characterized by the person or persons who organize the meeting, set the tone for the meeting, blah, blah, blah. So every atom, every planet, every little prince, principality, star, star system, whatever within the universe has its centers, plural. Right. We have centers here on Earth, but we're also centered around the sun. So which is it? You know, it's all the above. So centers within a decentralized centralization within a decentralized universe. There's no contradiction there as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, uh, you know, as this thing starts to take off, you know, no one, there is no indentured servitude. No one is bound to any one conversation. Come and go as you please, I think would be sort of the unwritten rule that would permeate the universe and um, so people can go where they want. Now, if, you know, um, if Elon Musk and, you know, some other AI experts and social tech experts and whatever are having a meeting, well, I imagine there might be millions of people who want in on that meeting. Um, but as my grandfather would say, I imagine there are some people in hell who want ice water. It doesn't mean they can get in. And so, um, you know, personal connections, personal relationships, those all persist. Just because we're in some new thing called a decentralized universe doesn't mean that we trash all that. And so people will have, you know, meetings that are in various degrees of public. So when we go back to the main room uh, of the block party, that's public. Anyone can enter. You can also get kicked out if you, if, you know, if you break, if you break, if you sufficiently break the rules, being unkind and whatnot being the main factor there um but very seldom do we kick kick anyone out but we do when we need to um so there there you know you can imagine just a, a control bar on your screen the degree to which a meeting is public and everyone's welcome versus no this is private and in fact secret i have no problem with secret meetings i have them with my partner all the time um and so here we're somewhere in between, you know, it's it's a curated set of invitees, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, we're also broadcasting. So is it private? Is it public? It's somewhere in between. Um, and so there'll be various configuration uh, settings that one can establish for their for their meeting. But one of the most important trends that I'm envisioning coming out of this is that people are going to gravitate towards and be attracted to those other people who are not necessarily totally like-minded. In fact, diversity is a great thing. Um, we want a degrees of diversity in order to, you know, bring in the techies with the non-techies, with the philosophers, with the whatever, and come up with some brilliant stuff. But, but people will uh, gravitate towards those meetings where A, they want to be in them and B, they're welcomed to them. And there are pathways to go from being an unknown to being highly sought after in, in certain meetings by virtue of myriad things. You could be podcasting, blogging, tweeting, and then people pick up on those. Bots help make introductions. Um, Bothub.com is a website. I Well, it's a domain name I own. We had never built a website yet, but it's similar to GitHub. Uh, but BotHub, you know, where people get together and co-create bots open source, and then they can be used for myriad things. Uh, bots, bots can be incredible facilitators, you know, matchmakers, making introductions. Um, part of the idea of BotHub.com is not just to create bots, but a great place for bots to hang out, meet other bots, you know, compare notes between their respective humans who they represent or groups or conversations or, or, or any levels of, um, and so people in, you know, analogous to a free marketplace, this will be a free marketplace of conversations. People can go where they want and people will very quickly, you know, with all the great mechanisms that exist and will be developed, will very quickly find, you know, again, not like, not necessarily like-minded, but symbiotic minded, let's put it that way, where we can form these optimal symbioses, produce, co-create, 
implement, broadcast, right? Influence, market, whatever, whatever our, our stuff is. And, you know, multiply that by 80 million and wow, you know, suddenly, you know, we're, we're sizzling with really amazing stuff. And so I, I long for the day when we've gone through whatever tipping points we need to get through so that it's happening, it's thriving. It's just like, it's incredible. And, you know, we've already got all the, a lot of this social networking uh, technologies where people can have reputations. Part of the reputation is at the end of this meeting, each of us can grade anyone else in this meeting. One of the most important things is, did they follow the rules? Did they follow the rule? Whatever those rules are, did they follow them, right? So if someone's knocking at the door and I say, wow, you know, my bot's telling me this guy or gal has said all these really cool things and I can see syntheses of them and little, um, you know, TikTok like summaries of whatever. Do I want, do we want this person? Well, let's see, how do they do on rule? Well, they're not too good about following the rules. Hmm. They seem really smart. They don't really follow. Well, let's give them a try. You can always give them the vaudeville heave ho and yank them off the stage. Um, you know, the again, the centralized owners of any given meeting will have that that control. And then, of course, they can vote on those people as well, and their reputation can continue to drag them down. Um, so all kinds of scenarios are possible. Um, and uh, anyway, I'm going to pass the feather. James has his hand up. Sorry, really briefly, I have to head off now, but it's been uh, really amazing. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, thank you. And please come back. Please keep coming back. We love you. We want you here. And uh, please come back every Friday and, and even to other meetings as well. Feel free to drop your email in the chat if you want to be on the block party mailing list or Victor can hook us up. Uh, if you if you need to go, just go. And then Victor can hook That's us up later. That's no problem. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ben. Yeah, All that's right. Good. Nice to meet you all. Take care. Thanks. Nice to meet you, Ben. Great to meet you. Have a great day. We'll see you soon. And James, you're up. Yeah, I know. I was just saying, like, uh, you see, I'm enjoying the conversation because, yeah, everything you just said there, like, it's all of that and, and more because the more is what we can't even think of yet. And the only reason we can't think of it is because we haven't enough people in the room in each of the different meetings to put the collective heads together or to think of what we need to think of. That's the whole purpose of the mat, the thing anyway in the first place. But it was something that Victor mentioned as well earlier, which is very vital as well. How do I know when I go into a room what I'm hearing is actually accurate or, you know, right sound information, whatever. That's a very vital part of it as well with the world of misinformation that we live in and everything else. And of course, Obviously, each of these different conversations, people, as you said, will gravitate to their own field of interest and conversation of interest. Um, so, you know, especially when you have the when you have that and the fact that it's all under the banner of transformation, you know, saving, healing, transforming life on earth, whatever way you want, banner you want to put it under, you're going to tr attract those types of people anyway. And those types of people will be drawn to the conversations that, that they are interested in uh, as well. The 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 essence of it is drawing a picture of that, getting a real, you know, and showing that how, you know, the value of the connectivity and how the greater, you know, the 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 best of the best will come out, will, will, will bubble to the top in regards to solutions or whatever, whatever or try, you know, whatever, the, you know, what we're working, whatever group is working on what or overall, the best of the, the you know, solutions come bubble to the top. But... Once that's established that it's like the, it, these conversations are, each conversation that takes place starts off, has some form of a foundation, like, and that foundation obviously is, should be peer reviewed literature, fact checked information as regards to what the actual, we say you're working on a particular field in science and you're, you want to produce, this is the latest information on that. This is the latest findings on that. This is this is the predicament we find ourselves in. We want to work on that. You want to know that the information is correct, blah, blah, blah. So the AI is going to do all that anyway uh, by putting the most relevant information up to date, up there for whoever is interested in coming into a new conversation. So they're going to get an in-depth, up-to-date, um, relevant I, uh, description of what com the conversation they're going into and the description of how up to date that conversation is, where they're actually jumping into, what actually what point they're almost jumping into the conversation, even if they're a new, you know, so a newcomer, so to speak, because the AI would be able to, to do all that. I don't understand how it would do it, but it will be able to. 
find in person, um, as you refer to this blood clot or blood barrier outside the uh, the universe of conversations. Yeah, that's because, like we said, there's only so many people, the 1% we say, having these conversations. If we can get those 1% within this universe and create this actual universe and connections, then those outside, we say, the blood barrier, as you put it, are all those other people, the 99%, who at the moment, again, as I said, have not had the veil lifted as to the truth of, of their predicaments. So it's only when they start to hear and see all of these transformational conversations within this network and get drawn towards the, again, gravitate into the subjects that are uh, of interest and value to them, that they'll want to be included in those conversations. It's then that the veil will be lifted from them because they'll be getting the true, accurate, peer-reviewed literature information. You know what I'm saying? They get the actual truth, right up to date, fact-checked information that they can fact-check for themselves, so to speak, if you want, if the people are worrying about misinformation in that sense. But they'll be able to jump into a conversation at its highest levels, current, you know, most, uh, you know, current uh, level, instantaneously, if they have something to put into the conversation, as I said, the, you know, answers can come from the strangers' quarters, regardless of the subject matter. I'll, leave, I'll pass in the better, I'll leave it at that. Well, I'll jump in since no one else has their hand raised, um, but feel free to jump in because I don't want to be hogging the mic too much. But let's just take Ben's participation today as an example of a really great example of someone who didn't know about us and ne wasn't necessarily, didn't seem terribly steeped in our paradigm of collective intelligence anyway. And, and after two hours, he says twice, I see now collective intelligence is the way, right? How cool is that? We just need for that to happen, I don't know, 90 more times and we're at the 100 monkeys. And once we're at 100 monkeys, you know, watch out. Watch out. Because once we're at 100 monkeys, that's, you know, 12 breakout rooms with eight people each right? We've barely gotten to two or three breakout rooms at a time ourselves, right? And um, so with 12 breakout rooms and eight people each, you know, that's the beginnings of a brain, like a real brain, collective human intelligence brain, and watch what that brain can produce. And I think once we hit 100, 100 monkeys, that's just a milestone. Um, I think we'll get to 200 within a matter of weeks, probably a couple of weeks or so. And then from 200 to 400, 400 to 800. Um, I think 100 is the milestone. Once we get to 100 of people like us who get it and we're like, yeah, we want more. Let's, you know, shoot, who else can I invite? And we're generating cool artifacts, recorded meetings and TikTok videos and podcasts and I don't know what else, you know, whatever. Um, I think we'll be we'll be a mega mega attractor, and I hope there will be many such mega attractors who have independently come upon the same idea. Because let's say that when we hit a hundred, we find out that there's seven other communities that have hit a hundred and are all talking collective super intelligence. We're gonna all get together for one big block party, whether here or someplace else. I don't care, but let's get together, right? And uh, I don't think it'll be too hard for us to figure out how and where to get together from that point. But part of the idea of decentralization, there isn't there doesn't have to be one place to get together. Let there be seven Friday block parties going in parallel with a couple hundred people each. What are we going to do? Cross pollinate. See you guys later. I'm going to go check out these other block parties and we're going to form a decentralized open source like map of all such block parties. I mean, do you see how close we are? Look at how close we are, right? When we had our first podcast, uh, it was only three weeks ago we had our first podcast and I was all excited right then and they were saying, oh man, we're gonna double our numbers every week. <laughs> well, that was, uh, I, I was kind of jumping the gun with my predictions there. But do you see how we've now gone from the flat line portion of the exponential to the knee? We're in the knee. We're still kind of in the flattish part of the knee, 
but we're getting there, right? And after the knee, once we've rounded the knee, the next part of the exponential function is the vertical, where we're like doubling every day or something like that, right? Passing the feather. Well, to be honest with you, know, I think that's a good place to leave it there, but for the recording anyway, because otherwise we're just going to, unless somebody else has something different to add to the conversation, I think we'll only start repeating ourselves and we don't want to sound that way coming across later, like, but, you know, for the recording part of it anyway, unless others want to have a chat, I think we have covered a nice part and I don't think we should inundate people with too much information to take and that's a lot already, like, so it's a good place to leave it, I think, anyway. So for my half, anyway, I'm 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 finished anyway, and good night. God bless to everyone that's listening, and thanks. Yeah, I'm feeling complete as well. Uh, been having to to do a bit of driving around, um, but yeah, fun session. I'm I'm a uh, I'm loving being here with uh, you, Jane and Marco, James, Mike. Uh, seems like other folks have done, have dipped here, but yeah, great sesh. Woo. Yeah. And uh like I don't know. I'm finding the uh the 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 vision or like the uh the the I yeah, the goal the goal of like getting to two X. Great. Getting to like two X again, great. So on and so forth, great. And uh like if you want to apply like our collective super intelligence to like you know directly manifesting that like i think there's things we can do <laughs> and so like if you want to spend uh, like these sessions sort of like yeah, actively um you know driving like that kind of that kind of outcome like i'd be down with it Jim, and if you'd prefer that that be sort of in a different container than the, than the podcast, like I'm down with that too. Um, so uh, my invitation, Jim, is like as the source of the uh, of, of this space or for this space, which I feel you are. Like um, my invitation is uh, it's like either that you uh, to you know chat about like the specific outcomes we want to, to like get to next and how to go about manifesting them either here or like um there's that one-on-one -on -one link in the uh in the vibe cafe that xyz like page use that and just like get together separately and jam like i'd, I'd love to co-create like i'd love to co-create on you know the collective super intelligence uh, uh like outcomes with you that uh so I can extend that invitation. Um, and uh, meanwhile, I'm continuing to like plot away at, uh, at my own coding projects that I feel like will will be useful for advancing, you know, the stuff that we talked about today. So I'm going to continue playing with those and uh, I'll be able to just share out uh, there was, uh, um, share out the processing of uh, of the, the transcripts that we've already got um, before too long here. So looking forward to uh, to offering offering that gift too. Thanks guys. Yeah, thanks Victor. Yeah, thanks Victor, seriously, because that again, I mean, we covered a lot again, oh, kind of in descriptive wise as to what is the, this collective intelligence we're talking about. And I suppose we can go on and go on and just try and describe it. But again, the the, the urgency is getting, you know, building it and building the processes, the, 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 you know, the technology, the AI, all the, what comes into, you know, making, build it, making these connections possible that, you know, on the platform, so to speak, or building the universe we're talking about. You know, of course, doing the, the genius work behind all that, I don't understand, you know what I mean, in that regard, you know what I'm saying? I'm just I'm here just to take part in the conversation, which of course is the vital part of you know you're you're providing the platform and the the connectivity for these conversations. I'm I'm one of those that will be more or less contributing to the conversations, 
um, and to many conversations because I'm, you know, I, I do get involved in a lot of different conversations. Um, but the point is, they interest me and they interest those that I get involved in the conversations with. And a lot of them, I find that they're, you know, they're all similarly connected in the sense, anyway, in the sense that most of those conversations are concerned people like ourselves, just concerned for their, you know, their families, their future, and the future of the planet and all life on Earth or whatever. It doesn't matter whether you want to think on the micro or the macro. I'm not going to go into it. Point is that um, we're here. We're trying to accomplish something. I think we've described it enough, but I think what we should do is work on the description more. To kind of like condense it, or to, let's if we could actually work on the description of what it is we're talking as a collective, as Jamin does so well now with the, the 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 screen sharing and everything else like that. Like it's brilliant for people to get a, a visual of it. Like that's what I'm talking about. If we can condense that visual, make it more, I don't know, not more, but somehow um, concise and and really appealing for those that want to get involved in it, both on the technological side of how to do it and those who want to get involved in the actual conversation, transformation conversations themselves because they're one and the same and uh, none will work without the other, obviously. So I'm going on too much. Uh, Victor, it's a pleasure meeting you as always and uh, thanks so much for bringing Ben along as well tonight. God bless. Thank you. Here. Thank you, Victor. What a huge, huge acquisition. Um, and, uh, so I think we're on, I think we're on the path. I think we're going to get to a hundred monkeys probably before we, before we imagine it, uh, just because poof, I just feel the acceleration here. Um, so I, I concur with everyone who said this is a good kind of stopping point. We we're now at over two hours of recording. So let's, I say at a minimum pause recording, maybe head back to the main room. We can keep talking there. We can do a separate recording there if we want to either for internal or use or public consumption. Any final words before I pause recording? I, I should probably just say that if we get to the 100 monkeys, it's like I'm not cleaning up after them by myself. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, no, no. No, and the 100 monkeys will probably be spread over multiple Zoom rooms. So, you know, and uh... <laughs> all right. Pausing recording. See you guys in the main room. <laughs>